Hello and welcome to the Symposium. My name's Carl and today we're going to be talking about canon and specifically what it means to narratives. Because a one James Whitbrook has written this article for Gizmodo, which is a far left-wing publication, and this is the postmodern argument against the idea of canon. And you might think, well, that's not exactly what he's trying to say. I mean, he's just saying maybe we should value canon as slightly less than we do. And that is, of course, the first step to undoing canon. So the question is, why does this matter? Now, this matters because anything that is created, especially something that we can consider an intellectual property, must have rules and boundaries in order to be coherent. If it's not something we can define within a certain set of parameters for certain reasons, as in narrative points that we can plot in our, our mental space, then it, it's not a thing. It can be anything else at any time. It can just be changed. And that really, to me, is what devalues a property, as we have seen over and over with the Star Wars franchise. Now, I'm not a fan of Star Wars, really. Uh, I'm not, not saying there's anything wrong with it, either. I happen to know a lot about it because it's become a fascinating study in what not to do with someone else's property. But the... The reason that this is important, and the reason that this person is approaching it like this, is because, and I don't know whether James Whitbrook knows that he's doing this, but this is this is the purpose of postmodernism. Postmodernism is a, a lens with which to approach the world and the things in it from the subjective perspective of the person. Now, or at least to deal with the subjective perspective of the person, because the the, the postmodernist is essentially adopting a position. Everyone, whenever they take a, make an argument on a, on a certain thing or give a, p a perspective on that thing, is, is giving a position. They're saying there is inherent and presupposed value in what I'm about to say and the things that I am going to be arguing for against whatever it is that is causing the contention. And the postmodernist has decided that instead... Uh, they're going to take the position of the empty space between the objects. You can think of it like this. Um, you sit down to play a game of chess, and you choose the white pieces, I'll choose the black pieces, and then we play the game. The game is played, we know the rules, we don't try to undermine the rules, and we carry on. However, the chessboard doesn't care about our rules, it doesn't care about who wins, it doesn't care about the pieces, at least with any kind of relative value to one another. As far as the chessboard itself is concerned, a queen, your queen is as valuable as their pawn, and it simply doesn't give a damn about either one. And so when you take this kind of perspective, you are equalizing the value of everything, and that is the reason that they attack narratives in the way that they are doing. There is no good outcome for people who want to see something built up to start attacking the foundations of that thing. And those foundations are what we will call the canon, the narrative foundations of a story. Now, the reason that narratives are important is because everything a human being conceives of is effectively some kind of narrative. I mean, just think about yourself. You know where you were born, you know who your parents were, you grew up in whatever school, in whatever town, you've got a series of events that made you the person that you are. The way that you identify yourself is through a series of narratives, and that's how you identify the rest of the world. How did I come to be in my house, in this room? How did you come to be watching this video? You can plot the story. It gives it a continuity. It gives it a purpose. You knew why you were doing the things you were doing, and there's a a necessary conjunction between these things. And if you start picking away at these narratives, then these conjunctions start disappearing. And suddenly you find yourself less with a defined structure and more with a kind of mess on the chessboard. Suddenly the rules don't matter, the reasons don't matter, and you'll notice that the thing you have actually isn't nearly as good as you thought it might have been. And that's what postmodernism is about. The philosophers who developed postmodernism realized that language only ever connects with other language. You can only ever interface language with language. It doesn't interface with anything else. And it controls the very way that you think. And if you can get someone to start, well, essentially abandoning their narratives, then you can get someone to believe anything. You can get them to do anything. You can get them to essentially abandon their own standards, because that's really what we're talking about here. And so postmodernism can be summarized very briefly as 
The rejection of meta-narratives. Meta-narratives are the grand overarching narratives of any one thing. I mean, we'll we'll speak in in the terms of fiction here. You know, so the the, the meta-narrative of Star Wars, um, I suppose you could say, is how to use the Force, learning learning how to use for how Luke discovers that he is Vader's son and ends up becoming Luke Skywalker, the legendary Jedi, after defeating Darth Vader and the Emperor. Uh, but if we if we erase these meta narratives as postmodernism wishes to do, then we can fill the void with anything, and it's a way of leveling the playing field and equalizing all things as being as valuable as one another, and claiming that there is equal value and weight in other narratives, which there frankly aren't. And this produces what I'm, I I can only describe as deformed narratives, deformed stories, which don't actually grip the reader. They don't inspire them. They don't connect in a logical and sequential way to form a story that stays with them and something that they learn a lesson from. There's no necessary growth or development or, or uh, procedure to it. In fact, the whole, the whole point is to erase that completely. Now, I realize I've front-loaded this with quite a lot of information, but I'll show you what I mean as we go through this guy's article because it's very, very interesting. As the pop culture we love becomes increasingly dominated by vast franchises of interconnected worlds and stories, so does it become dominated by one singular question from diehard fans. Is the thing we're about to consume canon to everything else we've consumed before? It's an attitude that is turning our love of stories into some bizarre archival competition. Now, just stop there. Why would we not want to have a comprehensive understanding over a thing that we love? It's not going to reduce our love for the thing. If anything, adding detail and information to the world that we have created. Let's just take Universe A. And Universe A is the the George Lucas canon for Star Wars. The original three films and then the prequels. These are the films that George Lucas wrote, he he being the creator of the series. Uh, It's not to say that other people couldn't add to that and create canon either, obviously. Um, But let's, let's just take this as Universe A, the Star Wars canon. Universe A. Adding details to the thing just enhances the richness of the thing to the people who have already bought in to the narrative. If you were captured by Star Wars, the characters, the universes, the motivations, and the payoffs, then you will want more to uh, more detail, more events, more richness to to enhance your enjoyment of that thing. If you don't like that thing. None of these things will matter. In fact, the pillars that make up the the narrative, the 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 story from uh, Luke Skywalker being born in some desert planet to Luke Skywalker defeating the Emperor, none of these things will matter to you because this is just not your story. You don't care. If you are going to engage with this universe, then you're going to want to do something else. And if this universe becomes exceptionally popular, makes a lot of money, and gets a lot of people employed and gets a lot of people invested, and you have an interest in, oh, I don't know, uh, smashing the patriarchy or something like that, then you'll you'll be looking at this and thinking, well, this is very, very much outside of my wheelhouse. There's very little feminist content in Star Wars. And I know people will say, well, what about Princess Leia? Well, Princess Leia was never whinging about the patriarchy, was she? But anyway... The, the idea of turning it into a bizarre archival competition is just for nerds on the internet. That's basically what this is. And I'm, I'm part of it when it comes to something like the alien canon. Uh, I've got a lot to say about Prometheus and Covenant. Uh, but, it, like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the reason people do this is just to better understand their, uh, their, the thing that they love. And in many ways it could be a comp- competitive thing with one another. But there's nothing wrong with that. No one's preventing you from enjoying or indulging in the media without engaging in the bizarre archival competition. And if something that's created that isn't canon, uh, that that doesn't... I mean, you know, like the Joker movie, the the, the new Joker movie. That's not really DC canon. It's not going to be connecting to any other films. It's not going to be part of the wider universe. It's a a sort of standalone, separate, you know, universe B from the, the standard DC universe A. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. If if the Disney uh, Star Wars films had come out and essentially said, well, look, this is a new Star Wars story, 
that we're not going to try and tie to the old ones because we want to do something different with it. Uh, I'm personally, I didn't enjoy what they'd done with it, but I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be upset as a fan. I'm not a fan, but if assuming I was a fan, I wouldn't be upset. And I, I would understand. I was like, oh, well, that's fine. It's just not for me. And I don't really care about the events in that because understanding the, the, the full scope of the narrative and including things that are contradictory or just end up diverting or destroying that narrative, well, it's, as you can see, a self-defeating thing to do. But anyway, they carry on and reassure us that canon is not an inherently bad thing, of course. It can provide structure to chaos, and it can provide a sense of not just continuity, but stakes as that continuity progresses. It's amazing that they use the word can there, because canon is the thing that provides structure to the story and provides the sense of continuity, and it is this structure and continuity that provide the stakes. Without these things, how could you suggest there were any stakes? How could you suggest there was any point to the story? If you don't know where you're starting, you don't know how you're going to get moving forward, and you don't know where you're going to, do you even have a story? And this is why I said that postmodernism is designed to destroy meta-narratives. It rejects them inherently, and that's what this sentence is. Well, it can do this, and it can do that, but if you're not interested in meta-narratives, why would you want a structure? Why would you want a sense of continuity? Why would you want stakes to be created? And why would you want stories to be resolved? Because all of these are part of the meta-narrative that they are trying to erase. The idea, lets, the idea lets characters bear the impact of events on their journeys across not just one narrative, but many, allowing them to grow and change to the point where they might be entirely different kinds of people compared to where we first met them. And there we go. Not just one narrative, but many. A meta-narrative, if you will. A series of narratives. Like, uh, a, a meta-narrative you can think of as a paragraph, made up of a series of sentences. And what the postmodernist is doing is chipping away at the definition of the words in each sentence, until the sentence no longer makes sense, until they've muddied the water enough, until suddenly none of these sentences in this paragraph make sense. And so the point that's being made in the paragraph is obscured and difficult to see and eventually hopefully just fades away because what they've identified there is the very purpose of us watching a, nar a meta narrative in the first place we become invested in the characters how they grow and change create life lessons for the people watching it you learn something about the human condition about yourself by going through these things watching luke skywalker struggle in a swamp to to lift you know to lift up uh, you know the x-wing or is it yoda that does that? i don't know i'm not a star wars fan but watching him struggle to train in the swamp and then eventually get defeated by darth vader and get his hand cut off or being chucked out of the death star or whatever it is and then eventually coming back to to defeat vader just that i mean that for example is a lesson to young men who feel that they have something they want to achieve to expect defeat expect to fail Failure is a part of life. No one succeeds on their first try, but the trick to success is not quitting. That's the lesson that's being imparted there. And if we remove all of the structures and uh, narrative points of that lesson, then you can't learn it from what has been constructed. If, it's, if we deconstruct it and take away everything that is relevant to that, there is no lesson to be learned. There is nothing to be enjoyed. Again, the thing that gives something the kind of emotional impact and the richness of the world is the fact that you can you can draw something, and I'm going to use the word spiritual, uh, but I guess what I mean there is kind of emotional, a kind of emotional connection to this thing. You, you are drawing that and it means something to you, and this person is trying to take that away from you. And this is the first step. Identify that, well, I mean, the purpose of the story, as in, you know, the canon, the, the structure, the narrative, the lessons learned, the, the pleasure that you gain from it. I mean, that, that's one thing. We'll compartmentalize that because normally that's the entire thing. That's the entire world of canon. That's all of Universe A that instead of you being in, now you're outside of Universe A. You'll see that you're, once again, the chessboard. You don't care about the pieces so much, but you're watching the entire thing. And suddenly, if you can identify and isolate Universe A, well, why is Universe B not as valid? no particular reason is there because you've completely removed the necessary connection that you had 
to the emotional weight that Universe A provided. And now, well, you know, don't worry about it. Now we can just move on to the next narrative, which will be just as valid even if you don't draw anything from it. But anyway, there's still plenty of room for variety and interpretation, even in a relatively strictly defined canon. Just look at Star Wars and the kind of stories it can still tell. Despite the mandate from upon high that anything told must be fit must fit into what's established since Disney took over the franchise. Okay, I just want to say, Star Wars does not have a strictly defined canon. Uh, it, it, Star Wars, in fact, has a, a very, very weak canon in which, I mean, like especially what Disney's done to it. And again, this is not someone who. This is coming from someone who's not necessarily a massive fan. I mean, so the, the Star Wars canon is actually quite difficult to identify. I mean, it looked like uh, the the Force was some kind of spiritual, almost religious uh, aspect to the world, the universe. But then George Lucas came along and said, "Actually, it's midichlorians in your bloodstream." So now, now it's not something that you can control. You are just born inherently with it, and I mean, surely that connects to the power. Of over the force that you have within the world, so now it's not even about your own expertise. I mean, like Yoda was a great Jedi master, but it wasn't obvious why. But it seemed to come from his wisdom and his uh, being, his 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 bearing, but and his you know the the amount of work that he'd done to try and understand these things. But uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter that George Lucas ruined his own canon there. Um, but anyway. But those stories benefit from the added weight of being definitive interpretations and events that flesh out an entire galaxy's worth of stories. But where canon, or rather a hunger for it, goes terribly wrong is when something matters or not becomes the base standard for how we consider a piece of media. The idea that we can have a a coherent universe that doesn't follow a coherent and identifiable set of rules is obviously nonsense. It is the rules that create the coherence. It creates the narrative structure in which we can understand why the events are occurring. I mean, you could take absurdist ideas. Like, well, I mean, you know, I I wrote a Star Wars movie where, you know, the suddenly you can hyperspace through other uh, other ships. It's like, okay, but that raises a whole number of questions. Why has no one done this before? Why don't they just create hyperspace missiles that are just, you know, drones like R2-D2 guiding these you know manning a missile that just hyperspaces through ships why wouldn't you do that you know you've opened a pandora's box that kind of unravels the narrative points that you've established up until the uh, up and up until that point so you probably wouldn't want to do that and you have to come up with an excuse like oh well it was a one in a million chance and it just happened to go off this time it's like well there we go that's very convenient isn't it so the reason that we have these definitive interpretations and and a a demand for consistency. The, the demand for consistency is, is logical and natural and inevitable if you want to have an understanding of Universe A. Now, it could be that, you know, you're the you're creating stories in Universe B, like with uh, Joker and, like, you know, previous interpretations of the Joker, uh, the new Joker film, and that's fine. And if anything, we can see here, you know, whether something matters or not is the base line of how we consider a piece of media. I mean, I saw people saying, well, you know, this is not canon. It's not coherent with the the rest of the batman mythos for example um batman's parents weren't killed by one of joker's goons during an uprising right they were just killed by a robber in an alleyway and so um the the director tying that in it's it's a nice nod but it's not something that connects with the rest of the canon because it doesn't make any sense batman and the joker's ages are not so are not that different i mean how could like the fifty-year-old Joaquin Phoenix as Joker, possibly be a villain for the you know ten-year-old Batman to fight in the future. He'd be in his seventies, surely, by the time that Batman comes of age and 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 becomes you know Bruce Bruce Wayne becomes the the Batman and goes out to fight. Well, you know he's fighting this pensioner. Well, that would be ridiculous, right? So you can you these things don't connect, and that's fine because the 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 standard for the new Joker film was as a piece of political art and commentary. It wasn't about enhancing the Batman universe. It was actually just a brilliant interpretation, an an effervescent interpretation of the Joker character that speaks to a current political moment in time. And so this argument of, well, things only matter when they're canon, that's not true. Things matter when they're good, frankly. That's the only qualifier, is that something is good. Something has substantive value and can provide not just entertainment but like 
nourishment to the audience. It, it gives you something. It doesn't waste their time. It brings them in and, and shows them an aspect of reality that they otherwise hadn't really considered how one thing would connect to another. It's why we tell, why we tell each other stories. This is the beginning of trying to say, well, look, none of the things that you're doing matter. It's an attitude that has become predominant, not just within fandom circles itself, but in the media commentary that has developed around these fandoms and the blockbuster franchises that dominate our popular culture. Critics and fans alike are now less interested in actually interpreting a piece of media thematically or to engage with why they liked or disliked it, but instead to pick it apart and break it down to the base components of what are essentially its pure unflinching facts. Google Star Wars or Marvel movies, and you'll likely see as many articles and videos with headlines like X confirms Y is canon, and etc, etc, as you will see critical essays about these stories, if not more. And before someone accuses me of saying this, well, this website does that too. Discussing canon can be fun, and it can add a lot to a series. That is not the summary. That is, that is not compiling the the full spectrum of information about why people are so interested in canon the the unflinching facts are not in a vacuum but from the postmodern perspective they are everyone a, 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 a regular watcher of a of a program or a tv program a, a movie a, a universe whatever it is is not concerned purely with the unflinching facts the the facts in isolation these facts are points in a narrative structure that form wider points in a meta narrative that form the story as a whole. Making sure that you have the pure unflinching facts correct and coherently are what really make that a solid narrative experience. It gives the the best entertainment value and the most enriching experience that you can have from the narrative. They are important. They make sure that the narrative is coherent. So you can't just pick holes in it. Plot holes matter. You, it, it makes your suspension of disbelief that much easier. It makes it very, very easy to say, yes, in fact, this makes sense. He, he went here, he did this, he went, he, this was the consequence, and from this unexpected consequences, this happened, blah, blah, blah. It makes it interesting. It's why you would want to know why these things are. And I agree that there are people on the internet who go far, far too into detail with a lot of these things. And they do have competitions of who knows the fandom the best. But to suggest that the base components, again, we've broken it down to the, the, the base components, the unflinching facts, to say they aren't important to the narrative is to say that the narrative itself is not important. Because the narrative is being extracted from the facts and how they are contiguous with one another how they connect why did this happen you know if you've got the fact that you got the why to the next fact and the why to the next fact and the why to the next fact and that's the narrative that is being we woven if you don't have a good grasp on these facts then you don't have a good grasp on your own narrative this craving for now uh, for the the bare facts above all else is a toxic attitude not just to the way we talk about pieces of media from a critical perspective, but in fan circles as well. The hunger for facts, above all, uh, all else, leads to things like filler episode, becoming a derogatory term for stories that don't advance the larger ongoing plot of a narrative, or don't include some shocking new revelation that one can add to the list. Well, I mean, the term filler episode is, I mean, I don't, uh, well, I mean, that is a derogatory term for stories that don't ad advance the ongoing plot of a narrative. But it's because it's wasted my time. My time is valuable. I don't want to watch just some muddling episode like in Star Trek where they've blown half the budget on like, you know, four out of six episodes and now they need to make up another two episodes in on the cheap and so produce filler episodes. Now, again, th there's nothing wrong with like, you know, a small scale uh, episode of Star Trek or something. Uh, you can You can build in you would have world building in these where you learn things about the characters themselves how they react to it, create narratives in the meta narrative but the, the the idea of a filler episode is just it's because generally real world constraints or lack of ideas or something like that but i, I don't think it's hunger for facts that has caused this and i don't really think we can blame hunger for facts for this um 
it predicates the act of gatekeeping. Uh, it predicates the gatekeeping act of being a fan that is built on how much you know about a thing over whether you actually enjoy that thing or not. It's an attitude that in turn feeds the equally unruly and constantly growing spoiler culture, because a fandom that values pure details above all else puts weight in knowledge of those details. Well, if you're going to consider yourself some kind of scholar of Star Trek or something, then yes, you need to know what the facts are before you can know anything. But knowing the facts is as much part of knowing about the thing as the why of the facts, how the facts connect. And if you don't know how the facts connect, then you are you are not accurately representing what is happening in the story. And so I feel that this person is not accurately representing why people care about these facts. And the idea that this is gatekeeping, yes. Yes, it is. Like, being a fan of a, of a particular product or a particular universe, it's an exclusive thing to be invested in the, the grand narrative, the meta-narrative of whatever whatever fictional world that you're enjoying. Like, I would never come into, I, I don't know, just you know, like any, like, Steven Universe, right? I would never just go into a Steven Universe uh, convention or space where they're discussing... The, the facts of the, the series of Steven Universe and why they like it, what makes it good, the impact, uh, the narrative impact of these things and the lessons that they learn from it and say, well, you're gatekeeping me because I actually don't like this. I actually don't find this very nourishing. I don't find this interesting. I don't think I'm going to get a lot from this. And so I think that you are actually preventing me from coming in. I mean, that's true. Like, and I don't deserve to be in there because that's nothing to do with me. It's not my interest. Why would I want it? But what I find it funny about this is that you can enjoy something that you don't know anything about. I'm actually really poor when it comes to the lore of Warhammer 40,000. Uh, my, my lore knowledge of it is actually very, very weak because I was really interested in playing it. The aesthetics on the surface were more than enough for me to be like, right, I can see what's on, I can understand what's going on here. Here are the, here are the good guys. Here are the bad guys. And... Here's an enjoyable universe and a game to play. I didn't need to know the intricate details of the Horus Heresy or something like this. It just, I mean, I'm sure it's very interesting. I just, it's not why I'm interested in Warhammer 40,000. But I'm not going to turn around and say, well, that means that people who are interested in Warhammer 40,000 for that reason are not allowed to, I don't know, enjoy it or are somehow trying to keep me out or somehow reducing my enjoyment of the thing. It's nothing to do with that. It's about being interested, and I guess we will call just a fan of that thing. If you're not really into the lore of a thing, then you're not really into the lore of a thing. That doesn't mean you can't enjoy it. They can't stop you from enjoying it. It's an attitude that in turn feeds the equally unruly and constantly growing spoiler culture. And this, the, the need robs discussions about stories we get of nuance and interpretation because who cares what you think happened when there's an answer from the word of God to that question that you might have had? And more sinisterly, beyond the way it shapes our discourse, it's a craving that further enmeshes our love of a world, not to the world itself, but to the masters behind that world. To twist a lit crit turn of phrase, there cannot be the death of the author if the author's got their own fandom wiki. Remember how I said it was about breaking all things down, so that no one narrative has created a structure, a power structure, and that is, uh, that is unequal, that is superior to something else. Again, like I said, if you've got the position of the chessboard, all of the pieces are equally worthless to you. You don't care about the life and death of any one piece. But if you've invested yourself in your, your team, then you will, and you've got a particular hierarchy of power there. And that's the complaint here. The masters behind that world. We are all slaves to George Lucas because we enjoy Star Wars and he created it. We're all slaves to Ridley Scott because he created Alien and we all are invested in that world. We are their puppets as it were. We are not thralls to George Lucas just because we enjoyed Star Wars or drew something out of it. Again, I mean, George Lucas is the, the prime example of this. I'm not sure he even understands Star Wars, to be honest. As as the as Red Letter Media pointed out in the Plinket review, to in, to to bring in midichlorians into the Force totally undermines what it was that made the Force good. To give Yoda a lightsaber totally undermined what it meant 
Yoda to be. Well, it showed the Force and the Jedi to be at their best, or at least we thought. And so instead, but anyway, this is why this is why I don't actually care about the death of the author. I don't, I, I or not, in fact, I don't care whether the author has their own fandom wiki because all they can do is imprint a fact on the world. Now you can get like J.K. Rowling style. Turns out everyone's gay after the fact, but this is always going to look weak, and it's always going to be something that people kind of turn a blind eye to. When it comes to actually enjoying the thing, I mean, no one's watching St uh, Harry Potter thinking, ah, oh, yes, Hagrid's telling Harry about the lightning bolt scar he has. You're a wizard, Harry. Also, I'm gay. You know, no, it's just not relevant to the story because it's not an aspect of the character that came up. And so, like, post hoc uh, re uh, rewriting in this regard is just petty. And this is why J.K. Rowling became a joke on the internet. It's like, ah, it turns out the reader was gay all along, doesn't it? You don't need to worry about these things. This is this is some sort of fear of being trapped in someone else's world. But that's what you're doing when you're engaging with a narrative. And if you don't want to be trapped in someone's world because you fear that gives them undue power over you, well, maybe you should just go outside and get a job or something. It's fine if you want something to matter to a world and characters you care about, but it shouldn't be the be-all and end-all to your investment in the either. Why not? What if that's what I want from it? What if that's the emotional impression and drive and pleasure that I derive from it? Is the internal consistency and the, the emotional force that the characters provide comes from this comes from this? Why do I have to why do I have to have any other kind of investment in it? Who cares whether I do or don't? We're talking about people enjoying pieces of media. I am surely free to enjoy media exactly as I choose. You've provided no particular reason why there's a should here at all. It shouldn't be that. Well, why the hell not? Why not? Why it, it? I could just as easily turn around and say, no, in fact, we shouldn't listen to you in any way, shape, or form. It should be the only thing you're invested in. Why? Because that makes it more perfect. And the more perfect we can make it, the better the experience will be. Checkmate postmodernists. But the reason that he's saying this is because, again, he's trying to knock out the foundations of the thing that you love in order to broaden it so it is now no longer that thing that the fans have built up that they love but is instead something that people who don't even like it can say i have a share in this and they don't screw those people you don't get to cl have a claim over every fandom ever there's an investment here there's an emotional investment uh, an intellectual investment and if you're not going to put in the hard sweat of mind and you know put the passion into it that other people have ha that have then you should be rightly ignored when you try to make claims on the fandom of a thing that you either don't really understand or don't really enjoy. Because it seems to me that people are not coming to Star Wars for what Star Wars is. We'll take this as the example. It seems to me people are coming from an ideological position outside of Star Wars, outside of the... the narrative framework that George Lucas has provided and are in trying to impose their ideological framework over the narrative and seek to change it in order to fit that. It seems that their fandom is actually a political ideology and capturing this fandom is essentially like capturing territory on a map for an army. Why should fandom be such a wide and shareable passion full of different opinions and interpretations about a thing, united by a shared vested interest and love for storytelling, if you're going to complain that the Empire is a white supremacist organisation. In a universe full of aliens, they have imposed white supremacy, which presumably is a very white Western 21st or 20th century uh, philosophical construct. And yet... It was Ryan Johnson, did he tweet out that about um, whichever Star Wars film that was he directed? He tweets this out about the Empire, as if that's useful to the internal consistency of the plot and the narrative that's being created within the universe. It's not. It's something external to it that they are imposing on it. Why on earth would we be interested in that? Unless you already agree with the ideology that's going to be intrusive to your enjoyment of the narrative experience. It doesn't bring anything to the table. It doesn't teach you anything. What it teaches you is that a bunch of ideologues are trying to subvert your media, and this is how they do it. 
by attacking the narrative foundations of a story and then imposing on it a worldview from without. Now, and remember, every every piece of media is created from a worldview. So, for example, if I went into into criticize a piece of media like The Handmaid's Tale, a good piece of criticism would be something from the internal structure of it. I'm sure that there are ways that I could criticize The Handmaid's Tale that would be inappropriate and not useful to the feminists who are drawing sustenance from that narrative. This is a dystopian tale about how a patriarchy could take over and essentially enslave women into being baby-making machines. And if I came in with a completely different perspective that didn't understand that that was the purpose of the story and said, well, these things aren't really you know, this isn't really the, the interpretation you should be taking from The Handmaid's Tale, even though that's clearly what it is, and the, the ideological perspective it's coming from, then I would be doing something inappropriate, in the same way that these people are doing that to the Star Wars universe and any other universe that they interact with. But anyway, valuing the sterile facts of those stories is more than the things about them that make us think or feel is a sad thing indeed. Well, they're core to it. That's all I can say. But, um... What you should do, ladies and gentlemen, when someone comes along with an argument like this, uh, just let them know that um, facts matter. The facts of the matter are what connect the narrative together, and without the narrative being connected together, you won't enjoy it, so the person who's saying the facts don't matter can just go away. <laughs>